Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Gayatri Ramakrishna from Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, Delhi. And today we are going to discuss about the module Frontiers in Human Genome. And this is from the paper Molecular Therapeutics. This module will be discussing what is genome, why there should be a need to understand what genome is, what tools were used to decode the human genome and how the human genome is the most unique genome. Further, this module will tell about what all new era of HapMap project, genome-wide associate studies, which is called as GWAs and epigenome have evolved in the genomic era. Every living organism on earth comes with a hardware that is a set of instruction to survive and procreate. This hardware is the genome consisting of huge documents of almost 3 billion base pair with just four alphabets consisting of the nucleotide A, T, G and C. It is amazing how these four nucleotides running as a sequence gives each individual an identity which is so unique to the species. In the course of evolution, some combinations of ATGC are conserved while others keep evolving giving the complexity. Of all the organisms, Homo sapiens are the most complex and decoding the human genome was a mammoth task. The most common question which is asked is what is a reference human genome? In fact, the reference human genome is a composite of many human DNA samples. At least for the human genome project, Almost 100 individuals or volunteers donated their blood samples from, who, from which the DNA was isolated and these isolated DNA were then cloned into the back clones. And these back clones were then repeatedly sequenced at least six times to obtain a composite of complete se representative sequence and this representative sequence is actually called as the reference human genome. The automation of sequencing and development of bioinformatic tools turned the idea that human genome sequencing is possible and this was turned into a reality in the year 2001 with the announcement of the first draft of human genome. The two groups that led this effort were the public consortium with funding from NIH USA and Welcome Trust UK and this was steer-headed by Dr. Francis Scoline. The other group was from the private company Celera Genomics led by Dr. Craig Venter. The Human Genome Project not only unraveled the genomic landscape but paved way for newer concepts on HapMap Project and Human Genome Project. We need to understand what a genome is, whether the genome is coming from a human organism or it is coming from a lower organism like Xenorhabditis. Now a genome consists of the total number of nucleotide bases. For instance, in humans there are 23 pairs of chromosomes and when we call it as a genome, that means all the 23 chromosomes have been completely sequenced. The genome can also be referred as the total number of genes. Now when we say genes, it represents the coding part and how this coding part is put into a sequence will form a gene. Further, the genome also includes the so-called non-coding parts which are the intergenic sequences between the genes. The major goal of the Human Genome Project was to determine the complete sequence and decode all the base pairs that make the human DNA. Now to do this one had to first obtain a physical map of the human genome. For this the scientists got the clones and mapped it to the different chromosomes so that landmarks could be made on the chromosomes. Once these landmarks or the physical maps were made 
then the sequencing was done and following the sequencing a curating of the reference sequence was done for each of the chromosome in order to identify a gene in that particular sequence people the scientists use bioinformatic tools to annotate a gene once these genes were annotated they were then linked to the linkage map of the genome so that the gene could be identified in which chromosome it is present now to do all this it required a lot of development of the tools especially the bioinformatic tools and technologies for the genome analysis basically there were two different strategies which were used for the human genome sequencing project the public consortium led by the national institute of health in us and the wellcome trust in uk used the mapped clone strategy in which the dna clones were physically mapped onto the chromosome so that a landmark could be obtained once the landmark was known then there was a process of building of the libraries by using these overlapping clones the overlapping clones were then subjected to shotgun sequencing followed by a draft assembly now the assembled draft which was uh, called as a reference sequence actually involved multiple sequencing almost six times of each clone so that the reference sequence is pretty accurate on the other hand the celera genomics used the technique of whole genome sequencing in which shotgun sequencing of small insert clones were done also paired and sequencing of the large inserts were done the major findings of human genome sequencing project are as follows this project revealed that there are a total of 3 billion bases in the human genome further the genomic landscape consists of diversity of genes as well as diversity in the gene density in fact chromosomes like chromosome 19 is gene rich while chromosome 13 is gene poor similarly some genes like gene titanin is the biggest coding gene and some are like that of the trna is a very small gene about 50% of the human genome is repetitive in nature with large number of retrotransposons long and short interspersed elements called the lines and signs further many regions of the human genome shows segmental duplication structural variations inversions and deletions one hallmark feature of the human genome project was the discovery of single nucleotide polymorphisms and it is estimated that almost 10 million snps exist in the human genome before sequencing it was thought that the human genome will have millions of genes however a surprising fact emerged which showed that the number of genes is too small and there are only 25000 genes in the human genome this was followed by the process of contig assembly incorporation of other data and integration to get the reference sequence by these different technologies the reference sequence covers almost 90% of the complete human genome the parts which we which could not be sequenced usually includes the heterochromatic and the telomeric regions this slide shows a table comparing the genome size vis-a-vis -vis the gene number in different organisms like homo sapiens the mouse the fruit fly going up to bacteria the second column here shows the number of base pairs in each of these genome if you see both mice and humans have similar number of genes and humans have two times more genes than the drosophila so the question is how then is the complexity of the human genome explained if there are only few genes like 25000 in number the complexity of the human genome is explained at three levels number 1 the single nucleotide polymorphisms which is nothing but the variations in the 
DNA sequence. The other is the structural variation and copy number variation. Both the single nucleotide polymorphisms as well as the structural variations have been coded up in another project called as the HapMap project. The third level of complexity is the epigenome. The epigenome constitutes the methylation, histone acetylation and nucleosome structure of closed or open chromatin. Single nucleotide polymorphism is defined as a genetic variation in the DNA sequence. In this example, both the sequence, the normal and the variant are almost similar, except for the position on the 11th nucleotide. Instead of an A, the other sequence has a T and this is what is called as a variation. Since the genetic code utilizes four different nucleotides, there are four different possible combinations at one particular variant position. So you have four different kinds of variations existing at the same nucleotide position. In a landmark paper published in Nature, it has been shown that there are 1.4 million single nucleotide polymorphisms in the human genome. Let us understand a little bit more on the single nucleotide polymorphisms. In general, there is about one SNP per thousand base pair. And as shown in the previous slide, there are about 1.4 million reported slips in the catalog. And it is estimated that the world population has about 10 million SNPs. All the SNPs in the human genome which have been sequenced have been catalogued in the DBSNP database under the HapMap project. What is the importance of the single nucleotide polymorphism? Every individual on this planet is 99.5% similar and the rest 0.5% difference is because of the variation in the sequence and this variation gives each one a unique identity and that's what the single nucleotide polymorphism is important as it gives rise to phenotypic variation. Further, some variations or SNPs are associated with disease making it important in medical diagnostics or for disease prognosis. Now one question which always arises in the mind is the difference between a single nucleotide polymorphism versus mutation. In fact, both of these are nothing but the genetic variation in the sequence as has been shown in this example. A position A in the normal and in the variant it is changed to T. Now these are some of the differences between the SNP and the mutation. SNPs are very common in the population with a frequency of more than 1%. However, mutation is a rare event and it is in only in less than 1% of the population. Usually, single nucleotide con polymorphisms confer an increased risk and they may or may not be associated directly with a disorder. However, Mutations, especially those in certain important genes like the oncogenes and the tumors, tumor suppressor genes, directly confer risk to a particular disease. SNP may not have a clear cut inheritance pattern. However, the mutations usually follow a Mendelian inheritance. This slide describes the various types of the SNPs or the mutations. That means the variation exists at two levels. One is a simple step substitution as we see previously also and here as well a single nucleotide A changes into T making it as a variant. However, besides this base substitution, one also can see in nature in the genome different mutations like the insertions. For instance, here ATCG is added up in sequence 2, making it as an insertion. In another sequence 3, the ATCG sequence is missing, leading to a deletion. These kinds of changes are mostly referred as the indels or the copy number variants. In fact, the indels can be as big as 1 kilobase in size. There are different types of SNPs or mutations. 
the slip can be existing either in the coding part or in the non-coding part. If it is existing in the coding part and there is a change in the sequence of the nucleotide, however, there is no change in the amino acid sequence, then it is usually called as a synonymous mutation or polymorphism. However, if there is a change in the amino acid, then it is called as a non-synonymous substitution, which can be a missense. That means one amino acid replaced by another or it can be nonsense when one amino acid is replaced by a stop codon. So what are the significance of the single nucleotide polymorphisms? As we saw in the previous slides, the variations actually give rise to the phenotypic variation, making each individual on this planet distinct and unique. Besides, these sum of the SNPs can also predict the predisposition to disease and thereby help in either disease prognosis or in medical diagnostics. Further, some of the SNPs can be associated with the drug response, making it easy for the clinician to prescribe a particular drug. Both the point 2 and point 3 has given rise to what is called as a personalized medicine. Further, the SNPs have been now used to identify therapeutic targets. An important aspect of the SNP is with respect to evolution where it has been uh, noted that the migration patterns can be decoded easily with the SNP variant. Further, SNPs play a very big role in the DNA fingerprinting technologies both in case of criminal cases as well as in paternity problems. How SNPs or mutation can be associated with disease? The stable here down shows that various disorders like the genetic diseases, complex diseases or those where there is a host and a pathogen interaction, these can be determined by one particular SNP in one or the other genes. So where are all these SNPs catalogued? In fact, the public consortium decided that all these SNPs will be catalogued at one single place, which is called as the DB SNP, which is an NCBI database of all the genetic variations. And one can easily access all these SNPs at this particular site. The decoding of the Human Genome Project actually gave rise not only to the HapMap project, but also has paved way for genome-wide association studies or the GWAS. To understand the HapMap project, one needs to know what a haplotype is. A haplotype is a set of DNA variations or polymorphisms that tend to be inherited together because there is no recombination occurring. A haplotype can also refer to a combination of alleles or to a set of SNPs which are found on the same chromosomes and thereby inherited together. Here is an example how at different loci or at different sites on the human genome or the chromosome there can be different combinations of the alleles existing. As we all know that at each site you can have a combination of either adenine, thymidine, cytosine or guanosine various permutation combination can exist. So here at position 100, 200, 300, 400 and so on, different permutation combinations of these nucleotides can exist leading to a number of different variants and each of this variant will be referred as a haplotype. Yet here is an example of single nucleotide polymorphisms and haplotype and how they dictate the genotype phenotype link. Here is an example of the color of the eye. You can see that at position 3, 11 and 14. At 3, if you have a combination of A and that at the 11, you have a combination of G, the combination AG gives rise to a black eye. However, at the 14th, there is no nucleotide A. However, in case of the brown and the blue, you can have polymorphisms like GTA or AGA, thereby giving rise to two different sets of eye color. The identification of the single nucleotide polymorphisms 
and that of the haplotypes has led to what is called as a hapmap project. The hapmap project is nothing but resequencing of multiple haplotypes or different haplotypes and individuals and all the SNP information are then deposited onto the hapmap site. The millions of SLEPs in the genome from four different haplotype groups such as the Nigerian, the Han Chinese, the Japanese and the Western European are now available in the haplotype map. Yet another development in the genomic era is the thousand genome project. As was discussed earlier that the reference sequence was actually a composite of many individuals. But now an effort has been taken by the international consortium whereby the different haplotypes and different individuals are being sequenced completely and being put into the database. This will provide information on many of the diversities of the human genome sequence. Besides the international work as was described earlier, at the national scene, an Indian genome variation database exists. In a CSR initiative led by the Institute of Genomic and Integrative Biology, the group has published a catalog of SNPs from the Indian population from 55 endogamous Indian population. So the new frontiers in human genome not only includes the HapMap project, but it has given rise to a completely new area of genome-wide association studies. And in the next few slides, let's understand what GWAS means. Genome-wide association studies are used to identify a particular SNP associated with a particular disease. For GWS studies, the group is made into two. One is a control group, which is the non-patient or the healthy group without a disease. The other is a patient group. For instance, let's say diabetes. From both these groups, many individuals are taken, their blood samples taken and their DNA isolated. Following this, a massive sequencing is done and using bioinformatic analysis, these sequences are compared in the patient versus the non-patient group. This kind of an approach leads to identification of certain unique SNPs which are actually associated with the disease. So in genome-wide association studies, one examines the genetic variation across the given genome and it is also designed to identify genetic association with a particular trait. For instance, the blood pressure or the weight or the obesity, disease condition like diabetes or any other and this is usually an unbiased approach of identifying a candidate gene and hence it is called as the hypothesis free approach. The approach which is used in GWAS is collection of cases and controls, sequencing both the groups by massive parallel sequencing, doing a bioinformatic analysis and by a meta-analysis identify a variant or a SNP which is associated with one particular complex trait or a disease. This slide gives you the importance of GWA study in revealing the drug response. In a study published in Nature in 2009, a genetic variation in interleukin 28b could actually predict the hepatitis C viral clearance following the interferon administration. So if at one of the positions you have CC genotype, that particular individual will clear the HCV virus and that is called as a sustained virus response. However, if CC is changed to either a CT genotype or a TT homozy homozygous genotype, then these two particular groups will not be able to give rise to a good viral clearance following the interferons. So this study tells about an example how GWAS has a potential to screen between a responder and a non-responder to a particular drug. 
So till now we've seen examples of single nucleotide polymorphisms and their utilities. Yet another difference in the genome landscape is the copy number variation or the structural variation. As is shown in the table down below, the single nucleotide polymorphisms are pretty small, either one base pair or going up to 100 base pair or one kilo base. However, in the genome landscape, one can also find large structural variations which can be either duplications, insertions or large deletions. And these all constitute the copy number variants which in turn gives a complexity to the genome thereby leading to uniqueness of each individual in the planet. Different types of variations observed in the human genome include massive insertion deletions and structural variations and these has been catalogued in a, in a much cited journal in the Nature Genetics. This slide tells about how GWAS or the Genome Wide Association studies were performed to identify CNVs which are associated with cardiovascular diseases. A number of genes have been associated or reported with incidence of the cardiovascular diseases and some of these include the Titan, the Myosin, the Rhinodyne receptor and Calcicristrin. In the human genome, the structural variations or the copy number variations have been reported and till now almost 1700 human structural variants are known of which almost 2000 genes are affected by these large variations like deletions, duplications and inversions. And these genes include the ion channel genes, the protein kinase genes and the immune system genes, thereby making the importance or the utility of the CNV in genetic disease studies. So once more recapitulating, the genomic landscape not only includes the this SNPs or the copy number variations, but yet another variation which is seen is the epigenome. It is intriguing that in an individual, it is the same genome, be it the brain, liver, lung, heart or the kidney. Yet with the same sequence, it is interesting that each of these organs is phenotypically different and they also perform different function. So how is it this possible that it is the same genotype or this is the same genome sequence but it is functioning differently. This is yet another complexity and this complexity is being defined by the epigenome. An epigenome is defined as no change in the DNA sequence but still there is an alteration of the gene product or for that matter the gene expression. Now the epigenome comes in different flavors. The epigenome is dictated by the DNA methylation which is mostly in the CPG islands. It is also dictated by the histone modifications like the acetylation and its deacetylation status and these two constitute together the histone code. Besides that there is also a nucleosomal arrangement which has been referred to as the nucleosome code. In fact, the histone code and the nucleosome code are superimposed on top of the genome and hence it is called as the epigenome. The epigenome dictates whether the chromatin is loosely bound or it is tightly bound. If it is loosely bound, it is easily accessible for transcription. If it is tightly bound, by the histone modifications and tight assembly of the nucleosome, then it is inaccessible for the transcription. The Human Genome Project has now paved for the Human Epigenome Project, whereby the methylation patterns as well as the histone code is being decoded now by the International Consortium. So finally, coming to the end, it is very interesting that the, both the human genome and the epigenome gives rise to a particular haplotype and provides variation in the population.
So one of the questions is, can your genome or epigenome make you a superhuman or for that matter, a better human? I suggest to the students to read a very nice article written by Miroslav Radman on how good is our genome. In this module, we have now learned that the Human Genome Project unraveled the gene number, their diversity, their physical positions, the regulatory elements, and most importantly, the identification of the single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. The available SNP database can be harnessed for knowledge on disease associations, traits, etc. in the population. And this has led to the development of a totally new uh, field called the genome-wide association studies. The unraveling of the human genome has also paved in way for deciphering the epigenome, which will further help in understanding the complexities of the human genome. Thank you.